Okay. So now in your, if it goes, there we go. We did this everyday example. This one is the hot chocolate example. You got your hot chocolate mix. You got your hot water. And then you mix them together. It's the sol solution. So solute is the mix. Water is the solvent. And then the solution is the whole thing. This is what you have. Um, you have the, in your picture, that's what I meant, on your picture on your screen, the blue, what do you think that is? Solute or so, uh, solvent. solvent? Solvent, which in this is water. And from now on, you're not going to see, like, you can actually see kind of the liquid behind it. From now on, you're just going to get dots to represent solute and solvent, okay? The yellow then would be your solute. solute. Okay? And so as you go move on, solute is the dissolved substance. And then the dissolving agent or that solute, that uh, liquid that helps to dissolve the other, um, the other substance, which is your solute, is your solvent. And then we said before, a solution equals a solute plus a solvent. And so then what's happening is that water, or whatever the solvent is, is breaking apart your solute. So the water is going in and breaking apart your solute until eventually the whole thing, you need me to go back, until eventually the whole thing is broken apart and is mixed into the solution. Okay? So the solvent goes to the solute and breaks it apart until eventually this whole thing is a mixture of the solute and the solvent. Sorry, it took forever to get there. Love technology. So we're going to look at, and this isn't in your notes, we're just, I'm telling you, we're going to look closer, much closer in the cell membrane now. That should have been, you know about the cell membrane, that it's a phospholipid bilayer, but there's other things in there. There's proteins and carbs, and you can see in the picture it's a, a protein right there. And why are there all these things? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's see if I can play this, maybe. The only minute. cell has three distinct sections. The membrane, the cytoplasm, and the nucleus. And you should have seen this in the, the neuron or the cheek cell. It's an ultra-thin layer that surrounds the cell. The membrane has two important functions, identification and connection. The membrane of every living cell has its own set of identity molecules, which extend from the membrane surface. These molecules determine how a cell interacts with its environment and with other cells. The second function of the membrane is to connect the cell with its environment. The cell membrane is semi-permeable, which means that only certain substances are allowed to pass in and out of the cell. Food and other necessary chemicals enter the cell. Waste and manufactured substances exit the cell. The semi-permeable membrane allows the cell to maintain homeostasis. It is one of the characteristics of life that the cell membrane helps us to do, which connects this unit with our next unit, which is cellular respiration. He's the guard. That's the guard that allows things in and out. So your cell membrane, it's a lipid bilayer. You don't have it, I think, do you have it somewhere? No. This is just kind of a review. That it's a phospholipid bilayer. So what um, macromolecule is it? Right there in the name? Lipids. You should know that, that it's a phospholipid bilayer. And you can see in the picture, in the thing that's being um, circled, you see two, um, um, like a, 
cir uh, little circle with tails. It's the phospholipid head and tails. And that is, that's your lipid bilayer, two layers of it. Made of fats and proteins. It's fluid. Fluid means that it moves. Okay, and you're going to see another picture of it moving in a second, or video a second. Allows for permeability. Permeability means things are able to enter, enter and exit the cell membrane. And then they're made of protein channels. Protein channels allow for substances to pass through that might be too big or that needs help. And we're going to get to that in a few minutes. Also, this is going to be online in, uh, on my website because I'm recording it right now, so you can go if you need to go and check it uh, later today or next week or whatever before your quiz. Um, so here's your permeability. Permeability is uh, due mainly to the way the phospholipids interact with each other. Why is that so important? Well, you have the hydrophobic tails. Hydrophobic means it fears what? What's hydro? Water, fears water. Hydrophilic means it likes water. Okay? And that is really important because that allows for the shape of the um, cell membrane because if it was both hydrophobic, it would, like, um, whatchamacallit, repel each other. And so you need to have the hydrophilic outside. You have three types of membranes in your body and in all cells. Your first is what we call a selectively permeable. Selectively permeable, remember permeability means what it allows to things to enter and exit. Selectively permeable only allows certain substances, certain materials to enter and exit. And I want you also to put up on top of um, selective, selectively permeable because sometimes we call it semi-permeable. So you're going to hear both terms, selectively permeable or semi-permeable. They mean the same thing. Only certain uh, substances can cross. And that means both to enter and to exit. So it's not just one way. It can either enter and exit sem uh, semi-permeable or selectively permeable. Permeable means anything. If it's a permeable membrane, anything can cross it, both going in and out. So we have selective, we have permeable. What do you think the other one is going to be called? Non-permeable, non -permeable, very close. Impermeable means the same thing. Impermeable means that nothing can enter it. So permeability... Again, what I'm going to show you uh, an example of what it is. You're not writing anything. I want you just to look and try and figure out, don't say it, think it, what each one of these uh, little substances would be, what the membrane would be to that substance. And hopefully we'll start. Okay, so there's three things, and I want you to just jot it down on the right-hand side. There's this one that looks like, I don't know, paint, pencil with an eraser on it. And there's this hexagon, and then the oval. I want you to write what you think is going on with each of those right now. So try and determine how the molecules are moving or aren't moving. Is the membrane semi-permeable? Is it impermeable? Is it permeable? Which ones are able to enter? Which ones are not able to enter? Which one needs help to enter? And then at the end, or because of technology, it will probably be the beginning tomorrow to go through it. So you should all be writing down right now what this membrane is. Is it selective? Is it impermeable? Is it um, not uh, is it permeable? And then for each of these three, the little pencil eraser looking thing, the hexagon and the oval, what's happening? What do you, what do you notice is happening? Okay, I'm going to have you talk to each other tomorrow because 
we probably don't have time today. Okay, moving on. Passive transport. We're going to talk about how substances go in and out of cells. Today we're really dealing with just passive transport. Passive, it's how it sounds, is that when you're sitting passively, you're not doing much, doesn't require any energy. Well, passive transport requires no energy from the cell, specific from the cell, for that substance to enter or exit. Okay, so that's an important thing you need to remember, that passive requires no energy. It takes advantage of the cell's natural environment for allowing the particle, the substance, to move what we call along the concentration gradient. What a concentration gradient is, is it, uh, it determines or it's the concentration of inside compared to outside. So concentration gradient is the concentrations inside the cell compared to outside the cell. And you have three types of passive transport. We've talked about the substances before. That was the three types when we did the demos on Friday. Diffusion. What diffusion is, it's the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration until equilibrium is reached. I have a fun little phrase for you to remember it. Diffusion, go with the flow from high to low. That's how I always remember it. If you like that, feel free to write it down. Diffusion, go with the flow from high to low. It makes me remember, okay, I need to go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So diffusion, go with the flow from high to low. Osmosis is a type of diffusion, but it's only the diffusion of water. This can trick you up sometimes because sometimes answer choices might have you say select all that apply. And if I say what is uh, the movement of water, and your choices would be diffusion, osmosis, um, or facilitated diffusion, select all that apply, well, you should choose diffusion and osmosis because osmosis is the diffusion of water. And then facilitated diffusion, that is um, diffusion using a carrier protein, and we'll get into that in a second. But that means it needs a little bit of help. It doesn't require energy, it just needs a little bit of help. You have this, maybe? <gasps> do you not have this? Or you do have it on the bottom, okay. Bottom right. So here's a picture of a cell membrane. You can see the phospholipid bilayer. So passive transport occurs when the molecules move across a membrane without energy. So right now, looking at this picture, and it is labeled already, but you see a bunch of these are CO2 molecules. I just know that they're CO2 molecules, but they're a bunch of oh, CO2 molecules and O2 molecules. Actually, no, H2O molecules and O2 molecules um, that are outside the membrane. That, you can see, is the higher concentration because inside you have none. So where do you think these molecules are going to move? Go with the flow from high to low. Where are these molecules going to move? Yes, Kyle. To the cell. Yep. Into the cell. So simple diffusion is when molecules can pass through. They're small enough. They don't need any help. And they can simply diffuse without any help into um, the cell, going from high to low. On the right-hand side here, you see that there are it, the, these molecules outside, there's still a lot more of them outside than in. So it's still diffusion go at the flow from high to low. However, this one needs a little help. It needs help carrying the molecules across. So how I like to think of it is, at 325, what do you guys want to do? 
You want to go. You want to leave. So if you're in here eighth hour, what are you going to do? You're going to get up, you're going to go, and you're going to go to the parking lot. So you have some okay, really smaller freshmen. Um, they are getting moved around in the hallways, and they're having a hard time going to the front door. Well, they need a little help. They're still going with the flow, go with the flow from high. Everybody's in the building to low outside the building. And so you get a big, burly senior football player or whatever that's walking. They need to go out the building also, so they're walking. And then that smaller individual is then following the bigger individual. Does that require any energy from that football player? No, he's walking how he would normally walk to the outside. And he's just helping that smaller individual out. So that's facilitated diffusion. Helping that uh, molecule move across the membrane without any energy. So we move down the concentration gradient. This is what it looks like. It's just a picture to show you. And now I want, we're going to be doing some examples. We should be on the, the oh, wait, not examples yet, because we've got to talk about osmosis first. So let's talk about osmosis. Osmosis, what is it? Diffusion of? Water. water, only water. There are three types of osmotic solutions. You can have a hypertonic, a hypotonic, or an isotonic. Has anybody heard of any of those before? Some of us? Okay. Hypotonic. Hypotonic solution is where the concentration of water is greater outside than inside the cell. And so in order to reach that equilibrium, if the water has a greater concentration outside, it's going to flow in. So it can flow from high to low. The water will flow in the cell, and that cell will swell. A way to remember it sometimes is hypo looks like hippo. And hippo is a big animal, so when you put a cell in a hypotonic solution, that cell will swell like a hippo. Like I like hippos. Eventually, this swell, uh, the cell, if it continues to get water in and in and in, what's going to happen to the cell? It's going to explode. explode or burst. So it could eventually burst. Hypertonic. If the concentration of water is greater on the inside of the cell compared to the outside, and we're going to draw diagrams uh, in a second, um, so go with the flow from high to low. So the higher concentration of water inside will move out to reach that equilibrium, and your cell will shrink. I think isotonic is the easiest. If the concentration is equal inside and out, this is the key thing that lots of students make mistakes with. Because there's a, a lovely question we can ask, say, which concentration where there is no movement in or out of the cell? And everyone's like, oh, isotonic because it's equal and nothing's going to change. No, that's, that's incorrect. What it's saying is, you're going to have an equal number of molecules going in and out. Like one will move in, one will move out. Two will move in, two will move out. So the equal flow in and out, so the total net movement is nothing. And the cell does not change that. Okay? So let's draw some diagrams. We have, let's start with isotonic because it's, the, it's uh, the easiest. In this picture, you see that it says that the cell, this round thing is the cell. And then if it makes easier sense to you, you want to put like a little beaker here. That it's saying 95% water inside the cell, 95% water in the solution. And so go with the flow from high to low. Well, there is no high and there is no low. 
So it's showing these same size arrows, right, going in and out, meaning the same amount of water is going into and out of the cell. And so for this one, there is what we call no net movement. So there is movement, but the overall is no net movement, and the cell stays the same size. I'm going to change colors so we can see the difference. So I'm dealing now with the hypertonic. Hypertonic is where the amount of water is higher inside the cell than outside. And remember, this is your cell. This is your solution. S-O-L-N stands for solution. Go with the flow from high to low. Here's what I do. I put an H where it's high. I put an L where it's low go with the flow from high to low, and I can clearly see high is inside, low is outside, so your overall net movement, the big net movement, is going to be going out. So it moves out of the cell, and so what's going to happen to the size of my cell? It's going to shrink. Why do I have a small arrow? Well, because things are always moving. So we're in the first one, isotonic, one in, one out. This one would be like three out, one in. Everything is, molecules are in constant motion. So then for our last one, hypotonic. Again, here is my cell. There is my solution. I like to put where high and low is, so 97 is higher than 95. Go with the flow from high to low. And so my high is outside, so my overall movement, my big movement is that it's going to move in. Move into cell, and what's going to happen to my cell? It's going to swell. Questions on that? So let's flip. You have this nice big picture on yours, and mine, unfortunately, is really small. Sorry, I will read it out loud because you do have blanks. Osmosis, again, is dealing only with water. Hypoton uh, hypertonic solution, sorry. The solute concentration is higher in this extracellular fluid. Solute concentration is higher in the extracellular fluid. Water will diffuse out of the cells. Water diffuses out of the cells, and so your cell shrinks. Hypotonic solution, solute concentrations are lower in the extracellular fluid, which means the water is higher in the outside and it will move in. Water diffuses into the cell and you can see with the, right, the red blood cells, if it moves in too much, it will burst. Plant cells, the cell wall is so rigid, cell walls very, or plant cells very rarely burst because they're so rigid. And then lastly, the isotonic solution. Solute concentrations are the same on both. And so equal movement in and out. Remember, it's not that no movement happens. It's that equal movements are in and out. I'll come right back. Hold on. I just want to see what's on the next one. 
And then in that little box that I just said before, unlike animal cells, plant cells generally do not explode in hypotonic solution because their rigid cell walls limit cellular expansion. Again, if you didn't write it all, you can uh, go back on my website 